University of California Cooperative Extension, and University of California Davis Veterinary Medicine is bringing to you a recording from their March 2023 webinar series. This series was co-hosted by University of California Cooperative Extension Advisors, Tracy Shore, Grace wood Nancy, Rebecca Ozeran, and Specialist, Dr. Gabby Meyer. Additional resources from this webinar and other cattle health videos can be found at UCANR slash site slash rangelands slash cattle health. This session is focused on time to help during calving with featured speaker, Dr. Brett McNabb, a professor, director of large animal clinic at the UC Davis Veterinary Medicine Teaching Hospital, and a practicing veterinarian working with commercial cattle producers in the Sacramento region. Our second feature presenter for the session is Dr. Gabby Meyer, a cooperative extension specialist in beef cattle herd health and production, also with the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. It's great to be here. Um, I'm here with Dr. Meyer, and I think this is a it's a great topic to talk about. It's certainly relevant to everyone. Um, I'm sure everyone here has um, been shoulder deep in many different types of calving issues, trying to figure out what's going on and assist as necessary. So hopefully we can be of assistance. First of all, um, if you are watching cows or heifers for signs of impending calving, there are a couple of different things to look for. Because um, of course, if we're going to think about intervention and helping, we want to of course make sure that she's actually at term and actually in labor. Um, the one that you can look at are your breeding dates or preg check dates. And so you might know a range of dates if you knew when bulls were in with cows or heifers. If you did artificial insemination, you might have exact breeding dates that you could then look to see if it's appropriate. And of course, if she was diagnosed pregnant um, by whatever means you used, um, preg uh, palpation, ultrasound, blood-based tests, um, you would have an idea that she's um, due to be calving. The easiest thing for us to look at in cattle and you know all livestock would be an udder enlarging right before they calve. And so we really start to see this develop in the last two weeks or so uh, before they uh, calve, just as they develop colostrum and it really starts to engorge and get taut. You know, if anyone here is used to falling out mares, many times we'll look at electrolyte changes in the milk of mares. And so we'll take a little sample of colostrum, look to see what their calcium levels are doing, sometimes sodium and potassium. And while that does work on livestock, it's really not practical. And it's not something that we routinely do, but just know that things are changing as it's preparing for, for the calf to be born. You can certainly look at the vulva. So the vulva under the influence of estrogen, that's gonna start to get high again at the time of calving, is going to get sort of large and soft and it's gonna to start to relax. We might see the cervical plug start to discharge. So it'll be this thick mucus that's gonna come out of the vulva as well as her cervix starts to soften and get ready to open. We also have another hormone that's being released called relaxin. And what that's doing, it's just what it sounds like. It's relaxing all of those ligaments all around her tail head and all around her rectum and vulva in preparation for calving. And so when this happens, all those ligaments get really soft. On this goat here, I'm showing, I can actually put my hand over the tail head and wiggle the tail head back and forth because it's so loose in preparation for calving. On cattle, you can't really do that so easily, but you can, if you look at them from the side, see that their tail head raises up because it's also getting loose. Um, and my wife tells me that relaxin has similar effects in humans and she was not a fan of relaxin. And then of course, you might see some re, uh, behavior changes. So the cows might um, isolate themselves from the rest of the herd in preparation for this. We divide labor up into three stages. Um, we like to classify things, don't we? So stage one labor is really just preparation for delivery. So that calf is taking its final position in the cow's abdomen, getting ready to engage in that pelvic canal is starting to put a little bit of pressure on the cow's cervix. And by that pressure um, being there, it starts to help dilate her cervix and again, preparation for calving. You might see that mucus plug, plug dilate, uh, pass during this period, and she's gonna get more and more restless and uncomfortable. Um, the second stage of labor is the active delivery of the calf. And so that's after her water breaks, we have that coriolanthic membrane rupture, we have all that fluid come out, now we consider her to be an active stage two labor. And that typically will last anywhere from one to four hours in the cow. Um, 
Well, after the water breaks, we'll often then see her start to have more forceful abdominal contractions. You might see that second bag present. So that's going to be the amnion that contains the calf itself. That often ruptures, you know, during uh, labor. If it doesn't rupture, you could certainly rupture it yourself if you're assisting. So stage two is done when the last calf is delivered. So we always expect one. Sometimes it happens that we have twins. But always, if you're assisting a calving, go in and check to make sure you're not leaving a calf behind at the end. And then after that, we have stage three, or expulsion or passing of the placenta. Uh, and you can see here in the picture, um, cows have about 120 of these little placentomes or buttons that connect the placenta to the uterus. Well, that allows all the exchange of nutrients and gases and everything during development. And so it does take a few hours for those to completely detach and then pass. So we'll call um, a normal progression of labor eutocia. Uh, and then we talk about an abnormal or difficult labor as being called a dystocia. And if we think about the beginning of labor, it's kind of interesting. Um, the fetus or the calf really instigates its own delivery. So it's driving the bus in this show. Uh, and it's really responding to the stress of being contained within the uterus, right? It's now met its maximum capacity in that uterus in terms of oxygen and nutrient exchange and just physical space. And so that stress lead, um, leads to a fetal release of cortisol or a stress hormone. And that sends into effect an entire cascade of hormonal changes. The cow goes from being this um, pregnant animal that has a progesterone hormone dominant state that stops her uterus from contracting and keeps everything kind of quiet. And it really shifts into this estrogen dominant state where we start to have more forceful uterine contractions and expulsion of that fetus. And if anything goes wrong in the process or if we induce calving with hormones, um, we might bypass the normal mythology here and we might get ourselves into some problems. That's when we speak of a dystocia and there could be um, a, a, a whole number of causes and we can divide them into causes for, that are from the fetus side and those from the maternal side. And so when we think about the fetus, things that can go wrong is just that the calf is too large. And that is actually the, the one cause that is the most common that, or that leads to the most uh, or most frequently to a dystocia. And that is just, well, it's part genetics. Uh, bull calves tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, it could be that uh, a heifer got pregnant too early and she is just too small and so then the calf is too big. Um, it could be an abnormal delivery. So that means that something is wrong with what we call presentation posture or position. And we go into what those are. Um, we'll show you pictures, et cetera, of what, what that means in a little bit. Um, there could be, uh, which we don't hope for, but sometimes happens a fetal monster. So that could be anything like a, a schistosoma reflexus. So that's a calf where uh, something went really wrong during development and its insides are on the outside. Um, sometimes, um, rarely, but it does happen, a calf has two heads. So those things just are not made to, um, to make it through that birth canal and that will lead to dystocia. It could be multiple calves um, that wanna come out at the same time, which can cause a problem. And then on the maternal side, it usually is what we call uterine inertia. So the uh, uterus is basically a muscle that needs to push out the fetus. Um, she also helps with her abdominal muscles, but um, the uterus does have to do a lot of the pushing. And so as Dr. McNabb pointed out, if anything goes, goes wrong with that whole cascade of hormones that we just showed you, then that can lead to problems. There could be mineral imbalances, and that's often um, a lack of, of calcium or magnesium um, where they're necessary for proper muscle function. And then they could just be exhausted. They could just have pushed for a while and they just give up. Um, there can also be birth canal abnormalities. So if the pelvis is just too small and the fetus doesn't fit through, 
Um, that's a problem. Um, the cervix isn't dilating enough. Um, that can lead to problems. A uterine torsion. So that is the case when the uterus um, rotates along its, its long axis. Um, often that's <clears throat> the case when a cow um, rolls over. You know, if she, I don't know, falls into a ditch or for some reason ends up on her back. Um, that can often result in a torsion. Um, so there is, the opening is basically so twisted um, and um, it needs to be untwisted for the fetus to come out or a C-section is necessary. And then there could be vaginal strictures. And that means um, that the, the vaginal canal is uh, maybe got uh, uh, there, there was some uh, previous dystocia with uh, some damage to the vaginal canal. And what, if that scars down, then the next time could be um, more difficult to, uh, to have a cow. But yes, so you should definitely um, monitor as frequently as you can during the calving season. Uh, the earlier you can intervene, the more likely is a successful delivery. All right, so um, <clears throat> there are a few golden rules of, of bovine obstetrics and they're basically summarized in this slide. So you wanna be safe. Uh, that means you wanna have uh, appropriate restraint for the cow so that both her, you and um, the cow is, is, is safe. You wanna be clean, that's very important. And then you wanna use plenty of lubrication. And we'll talk about um, each of these in, a, in more detail. So <clears throat> the restraint is often, well, in, for beef cattle, that typically means uh, restraint in a cattle chute. However, if the cow is on a pasture and she's down, uh, you can approach her and pull just where she lies. Um, you want to just approach cautiously, slowly, so you don't entice her to get back up. Um, if she's already, you know, if she's already pushing and you, you see a fetus, it may just be the easiest thing to try and, and pull that calf where that cow is instead of trying to get her into a chute. Um, so cleanliness. Um, one of the things you want to do if you have a cow in the chute is to tie the tail to the side. Um, so on the left side, you can see how we usually do that here in the clinic. So we, we put some um, dog leashes together and then you want to tie the tail around her neck rather than to the side of the chute. In case she goes down, you don't want to have that tail break in that process. Um, you want to wash around the perineum. So there's usually a lot of manure stuck to it. And once you, um, you, you explore for a fetus, you could inadvertently in, um, introduce a lot of those uh, bacteria and, and dirt into that environment, and they can then lead to um, metritis or uh, other problems. So you want to be as clean as possible. And then obviously you also want to wash yourself before you uh, explore. So take off your watch um, and then you want to wash both your hands and your arms. You wanna go up at least to your elbow because that's probably how deep you have to go in. Um, use some soap, normal soap is, is fine. If possible, also take off any jewelry. Um, and then once you're all dried off, we recommend to put on some OB sleeves. Often, if you have to do a lot of manipulations, they will end up ripping and you may just you know, abandon them after a while, but for a simple intervention, it's definitely good. It's also good to use those because um, you could be exposed to zoonotic agents. So there are a few things um, that lead to abortions that are zoonotic, like leptospirosis is one, um, brucellosis, well, we don't really expect that anymore, but you know, it's not impossible. So overall, it's just also good practice to, uh, to protect yourself. And then um, the last uh, of the golden rules is to use lots of lubrication. 
So we recommend water soluble um, lubrications like uh, lubricants like methyl cellulose that you can buy in these gallon jugs. There's also a powder called J Lube that's very popular. Um, the only problem with J Lube is if you do end up having to go to a C section, then um, and, the, and this powder enters the abdominal cavity of the cow, it can lead to um, inflammation of that abdominal cavity. So uh, the, the methyl cellulose is really, is really the best one. And then we have also oil-based petroleum jelly that is also more irritant to the reproductive tract. But you know, if, if, you, if you don't have anything else, then obviously uh, you still wanna use um, lubrication. But the, you can also mix the methyl cellulose in a, with a bucket of warm water and then use one of those hand pumps and with a hose, you can just deliver that into the vaginal canal and get a lot of lubrication just around the fetus. Um, and that will make things a lot easier. And so this is just sort of a, an algorithm for calf delivery. Um, so when calving begins and everything goes great, then you have a spontaneous delivery and you're done. But if calving is interrupted because of any of those reasons we mentioned, um, then you need to check for presentation position and posture. And again, we'll tell you more what that, is, what that means. Um, so if you, if you realize that there's something wrong, you need to correct um, a, a leg that's, that's, that's in the way or, or there is twins or it's a breach, um, then go ahead and, and do that um, in order for that calf to be able to, to be expelled. Um, so once you have the calf in the, in the correct presentation position and posture, you have to make a decision, well, is extraction possible or not? And the way you decide that is um, by, you have to estimate whether this calf will make it through the birth canal. So if you can pull the legs out about 15 centimeters, which is about two hands width, um, the extraction should be possible. So then you pull or you use a calf jack and you get that calf out. If you run into hip lock, well, the hips are the, the widest part. And so if the hips get stuck um, in the pelvis and the calf is alive, you already, you already so much, you know, you, you've already reached a point where you just have to go through with it. So the calf has to come out. If the calf is dead, you probably want to stop at that point, call your vet and they can do a, what's called a partial phototomy. So cut that fetus um, in parts so that um, you're not risking causing the cow um, extensive injuries. If you decide the extraction is not possible um, and the calf is alive, then a C-section is indicated. And if the calf is dead, um, then a, a total phototomy will, will have to be done. And obviously those are always uh, done by, by your veterinarian. Okay, so if you determine that you need to intervene, so calving is not progressing and um, you're worried because of the timeline or how the cow or the heifer is presenting, then you're going to go in and explore and try to diagnose what's wrong, right? And so, of course, you've been, you're being safe, you're being clean, and you're using lots of lube for this procedure. Um, but when we think about exploring and figuring out why the calf is not delivering normally, we like people to think about three different um, aspects to how that calf is positioned. So the first will be what we call the presentation. So is it pretty much, is it head first or hind limbs first, right? So we'll talk about cranial first, where the head's coming first, or caudal, where the hind limbs are coming first. Transverse, where you have all four legs or the back, the vertebral column or the spine um, is possible, but relatively uncommon in cattle. The next thing is the position. So it's really going to be the back or the dorsum of the calf relative to that cow's pelvis. And so normally, like the calf that's pictured here, we'll have a dorsal sacral where the back side of the calf is up against the um, top side of the cow's pelvis. 
if it rotates one way or the other, or the cap is completely upside down, that's where you get into dorsal pubic or dorsal ileal. It can be a little bit harder to correct, but we'll show you a few ways to do that. So you basically want to think, is the cap straight up and down, or is it rotated one way or the other? And the last thing will be the posture. And this is the most common correction that we're going to make. Um, that's how the limbs or the neck of the calf are positioned. Um, so relative back to the calf itself. This is where we'll get into situations where we need to extend a leg or do some flexion or pull a head back around. So in the case of the calf here, it's a, caudal, a cranial presentation because the head is first. Um, we'd call it dorsosacral because the calf is upright with its backside along the top of the cow's pelvis. And in the posture, we'd say that both front legs are flexed back at the shoulder. So as you can see, that's going to need correction in order to be able to have a vaginal delivery. Next, please. Thanks. So you can, um, you're going to be blind, of course, while you're feeling this, but you can methodically go in, think about what you're feeling and what part of the calf that would be. And you can get a lot of information by doing this. And it's not just, um, you know, an academic exercise. Really, if you know what's wrong, then you can make a plan to correct it and actually achieve a correction and a vaginal delivery. So in the cow on the left here, again, we have a cranial presentation. Um, we'll call it dorsosacral. So the calf's back is against the top of the cow's pelvis, but the calf's neck and head are flexed back to the calf's left, which would correlate to the cow's right side. So that's something that we'll need to go in. We'll be able to feel the neck as it curves around and then dives down towards the back of the head. You'll know that in a normal, quote unquote, normal delivery, most of the time the front leg should be extended like this and the head and muzzle right in between the knees of the calf so that it's coming out like that. So as you follow those legs up to the body, you can then feel the relation of the head and make a judgment call as to what's going on. The middle would be a true breach presentation. So the term breach gets thrown around a lot, um, but a true breach in cattle is where you have a caudal presentation, so the hind end coming first, and you have both legs flexed at the hips. So it's almost this dog sitting position where the calf's um, tail is getting into the cow's pelvis. And as you can see, they're not going to be able to go through there no matter how hard she pushes. Uh, these are some of the more difficult ones to correct, but we'll give you some tips in a few minutes on how to correct a breech calf. The cow on the right is actually just a normal caudal presentation, so a normal backwards calf. And this is perfectly acceptable. This is not breech, right? Um, but it can be delivered just fine. One thing to keep in mind, though, you know, we talked about a one to four hour window for stage two labor for normal calving, um, which is perfectly fine, but that's uh, contingent on the fact that the umbilical cord is connected to the calf and still supplying that calf with oxygen and nutrients. So in these um, backwards calves, you can see how the umbilical cord may get pinched off at the cow's pelvis if it's there for a long period of time. So we do see a higher risk to leaving a backwards calf or a um, caudal presentation uh, like this for too long as compared to a front or a cranial presentation. And so then, of course, if you're trying to figure out, are these front legs or back legs, or do they belong to the same calf? Uh, there are a couple of tricks that you can do. Um, many times you can make a judgment call based on how the hooves are oriented, right? Because you figure front limbs are going to often have hooves angled down. Hind limbs are going to often have hooves kind of angled out or up. But that's not 100% true all the time, depending on how you go. So what you could do is if you're going in blind, again, being safe, being clean and using lots of lube, you can identify the fetlock of the calf um, and then follow that leg up to the pointy joint of the leg. So on the front leg, the pointy joint will be the elbow. And on the back leg, the pointy joint will be the hock. And so on the front limbs, you'll have a flexible joint, the, the knee or the carpus, in between the fetlock and the pointy joint of the elbow. On the hind limbs, you won't. So it'll just be fetlock, cannon bone, and then you'll feel the pointy joint of the hock. And so it can be a, a simple way to um, differentiate front from rear legs. You want to palpate the neck and the head. So feel where it is and make sure that the muzzle is actually facing 
um, towards the vagina and not turn back away. You do want to count feet and legs. And so we do want to follow those legs up to the body of the calf and then come back from the body down the other leg if you have two legs presenting at the same time. It's less common in cattle as compared to sheep and goats to have multiples coming at the same time, but it does happen. And you really don't want to be trying to pull two different calves out at the same time, uh, one limb on each other. And no matter how many calves you've pulled, if you've pulled the third calf out of there, please be sure to go in and check for the fourth, right? So it, we do see it occasionally where you put all this work into correcting a calf, delivering it, and then one accidentally gets left behind, behind it because no one went in to check to see if she had a twin. So just always check to make sure that she doesn't have anything else in her uh, before you let her out of the chute. All right, and here is a little demo for um, what Dr. McNabb just described. So to distinguish four legs from hind legs, so you, you go in, you feel for that the fetlock, and then the second joint that you feel would be the carpus, and if it bends the same way as the fetlock, um, and then the next joint is the pointy joint, and that bends the opposite way than the fetlock, and you know it's, it's, a, front, it's a front leg. On the other hand, the hind leg. So again, we're feeling the fetlock, we're feeling our way to the next joint. If that's the pointy joint, um, then that's the hock. And that bends the opposite way than the fetlock. So then of course you're gonna be wondering too, especially if it's been a prolonged labor, um, is the calf alive? And is it stressed and going to be um, a bit of a higher risk calf once it's born? So there are a few reflexes we can use. So in the anterior or cranial presentation where the head's coming first, you may be able to get um, a suckle reflex. If you were to put your finger in its mouth, even while it's still in the uterus, um, if you can reach that to see if it starts to suckle. We talk about a blink or a menace where you can brush the eyelashes or the eyelid um, and you should get, feel a blink Usually that's a little bit harder to discern when they're in the uterus still. The really telling thing is what we call a withdrawal reflex. So if you have a legs out and you pinch in between the hooves, that's a pretty painful thing to happen. And so they should pull back and try to get away from that painful stimulus. And if you get a good withdrawal reflex, you know that calf's alive. If you don't get a withdrawal reflex, there's still a chance it could be alive and just in a very heavily sedated state or it could be somewhat compromised. And so a negative withdrawal isn't always the most telling thing. And if the hind limbs are coming first, again, you can use that withdrawal reflex on the hind limbs or look for anal tone if you were to touch the calf's anus while it's still in there. Pulse can be pretty hard to do. And so while we talk about it, um, it's really hard to get a reliable pulse on the calf while it's still in the uterus. Even if you can reach the umbilical cord, which most of the time you wouldn't be able to when it's really far in, um, you could still have some pulsing going to the calf even after it's dead. What you could do sometimes if you can get to the side of the chest, kind of in the armpit of the calf, you may be able to put your hand up against the chest wall and feel a heartbeat there. And so that's a good indication that you know that the calf would still be alive. Um, we do see some acid base changes. We see some slight electrolyte changes as these calves come through the birth canal. And it's a really interesting phenomenon, right? Because they've been quiet for nine months as they were in the uterus. And now they're going through a pretty stressful, narrow path through the cow's pelvis before they are born and come out into the world. And this is a very normal physiologic phenomenon to have this fetal stress that happens where we start to see heart rates going and then drop slightly, the respiration changes and their electrolytes change. Once they come out though, they should come to and stand. And we often think that that passage and that stress is required for a normal calf to, uh, to behave normally as soon as it's born. If they've been prolonged in labor, you might see meconium staining. So meconium is fetal feces, right? And when they've been um, in labor for a while, they may defecate in utero. That's what gives this brown orange coloring and staining to the fetus. We know that's an indication that they've been in labor for quite a while. Um, and we know that those, if they breathe them in, swallow them in, aspirate them, that it's very irritating to their lungs and it can actually set them up for a cathode pneumonia. 
So depending on how stressed the calf was during a prolonged labor, or if we had a lot of intervention, we may consider even giving a dose of antibiotics to the calf once it's born um, as a preventive measure to prevent pneumonia from setting. So these are basically the options to correct dystocia. So you can do what we call mutation and then controlled vaginal delivery. So that's basically when so you realize something's go, something's not uh, progressing. You go in, you correct the malposition or um, um, posture, and then you apply traction to get that fetus out. Um, often what you will need to do is what we call retropulsion, and we'll give you some examples later on. So this becomes important especially in a breach, but often in, in other uh, problems as well. So that just means that you have to push the fetus a little bit back into the uterus because the vagina is you know, very narrow. You don't have a lot of room to manipulate legs or anything else. So what you need to do is push that um, calf back in, but you wanna do that when the cow is not pushing. You don't wanna work against her uh, so when she doesn't doesn't push, you can try and push the fetus in back in as much as you can so that you have a little bit more room to work. Um, rotation, so that would mean rotating the fetus on the longitudinal axis. So that might be necessary for a, during for a torsion. And um, that is not that simple. Um, so often this will require a vet to come out and, and help you with that. Extension and adjustment of the extremities. So this is definitely something that you should attempt because often it's, it's, not, that, it's not that hard. Um, and once you have that leg in the right position, um, the fetus, the calf will come out fairly easily. And then, of course, the other sec the other possibilities are a C-section, which shouldn't be the last resort. So, you know, if you don't make progress, so usually, you know, you want to have a rule of thumb. Okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to try this, but um, you don't want to try forever. You don't want to try for hours. Um, you have to be honest and say, okay, I've given it a, a good go, and I cannot, I cannot fix it. So. You know, you don't want to go on forever just because you want to avoid the C-section. And then if the calf is dead, um, a phytotomy is uh, preferred because a C-section is, is an invasive surgery and um, you're opening up that uterus to the outside. Um, while with the phytotomy, which can, can also be somewhat traumatic, of course, um, but often you're getting... Um, the, the recovery for the for the cow is faster. So these are uh, basically the tools of the trade. So this is what you should have on hand before the calving season starts. So we have some sleeves and gloves as already shown. You have the chains down there on the lower right. Um, you also need handles. Um, you want to have a head snare. And we don't have a picture of this here, but we'll show you what that looks like later. Potentially eye hooks, although I have to say a head snare is probably easier to handle. Um, and so, and we don't have a picture of that either. So I would recommend just to get the head snare. Um, a traction device, especially if you expect that you might be by yourself, then that, um, you know, makes it a lot easier. And we'll show you how to properly use it. So that's also known as a calf jack. Um, there's a, a picture of it on the bottom. It's missing a part, but we'll, sh we'll show you an example later on. And then of course, uh, plenty of lubrication. And so um, when you're ready to pull, uh, you wanna put these chains on the legs and there is a right and a wrong way to put them on. So let me show you here how to put them on. So um, the most important thing is that you put two throws. So one above the fetlock and then one below the fetlock. So you, you catch the loop and you wanna cross, you wanna have the chains cross on the underside of the leg. So not on the bony part, but on the soft tissue side. 
And then, of course, you do that with the other leg as well. We're going to speed that up in a second. So you make that second throw. And then make sure that it sits tightly. You attach the handles. Make sure that doesn't they don't slip off. And then you're ready, you're ready to pull. Okay, so if you have a normal presentation, position and posture, right? So everything is positioned normally, the calf's head is engaged next to the um, the front limbs and it just needs some assistance. We're gonna apply the chains in a very clean manner and then um, have a couple of principles as we deliver. So again, because we have um, often what we term a fetal maternal mismatch, so the calf is simply too large to fit through the maternal pelvis in an easy way. Um, we often need to think about how we can help them along. So if you think about having a broad shouldered person walking through a narrow door, that's often what we're doing. So if you can sort of walk the legs out one at a time by taking one limb forward and then the next limb forward, you can work the limb, the legs, their shoulder blades and their whole chest through a fairly narrow uh, pelvic canal in the cow or the heifer. Um, Gabby already mentioned earlier, just a rule of thumb that if you can get the fetlocks um, in my hands, at least a hands width, but usually one and a half to two hands widths past the, the, the vulva, then you should be able to deliver that calf vaginally because that means that the chest and the shoulder blades are already engaged in, in the middle of that cow's pelvis, which is gonna be the widest part of the calf and the narrowest part of the pelvis coming through. So you should be able to achieve delivery there. That being said, the hips of the calf stick out like this. And we, as you can see, the cow's pelvis is an oval shape. So if we're gonna have a tight fit, we do run the risk of a hip lock. So to avoid that, we can rotate the calf one way or the other to get the widest part of the calf's hip through the widest part of that oval of the cow's pelvis. So we can do that by simply crossing our chains over and rotating that calf as we're pulling it out. We're also going to keep in mind what we call the arc of delivery. And I have a, a good picture of a goat here, but it's the same concept where this calf is coming out of the back of the abdomen of the cow through the pelvis and then back out into the world. And so if we can mimic that curve, we can actually work with nature a little bit and help to deliver. If you just pull a calf straight out, um, you can actually force that calf to rub up against the, um, the top part of the cow's pelvis create some friction and create some other potential obstacles that you don't need to be worrying about. So you're gonna walk them through, you're gonna rotate and you're gonna angle down at the same time. And we'll show you what that looks like here. And so um, uh, just to clarify, this is not me uh, in the picture, um, but uh, I haven't asked that question by vet students before. Um, so I said it's a quick story. So when I was in vet school years ago, um, there was a British, resident here and he had just arrived and started the program and we went out to a calving um and we're all getting ready to go you know and he goes over there takes off his shirt and goes to grab the chains and everyone just stands and looks at him and like, what is going on and he's like what well in england and many other countries it's quite common for um men to take their shirts off so they keep their shirt clean while they assist and pull on calves um, as he learned that day, it's not a common custom here in the United States to do that. So it's not a standard practice. Uh, I can only imagine um, how it must feel. Uh, anyway, so there is a what we call the two strong men approach, or I guess we should say two strong persons approach to, um, to delivering. If two strong people cannot deliver the calf as it is, then it's not coming out that way, right? So once we have chained up and we're rotating and arcing down, we are gonna pull and apply traction when the cow or the heifer pushes. Um, if she's resting and in between contractions, then you should rest too. But you're really doing this to assist her as she has a natural push. And as you can see, we're just simply crossing our chains over and that's gonna force that calf to rotate about 45 degrees 
which is enough to achieve the rotation that we want to see. Um, so we say two strong men or two strong people uh, because there were some interesting numbers that came out of a project years ago looking at the force that's applied when you have different things pulling on something, especially when we look at two calf legs uh, coming out. And so we know the cow is pushing at about 70 kilograms of force when she's pushing at her strongest. Um, we know two strong people can apply well over 180 kilograms of force across a stretch. And we know the calf bones break um, right about that same point. And I've seen plenty of calf limb fractures that have come from people being overly aggressive on how much tension they put. And so we'll talk about the proper use of a calf jack in just a minute. Um, but you can create too much tension and too much force, even with the calf jack, to cause a fracture above the fetlock um, of the calf's cannon bone. And I'll say it now, and we'll say it many times, um, a mechanized implement, so um, a truck, a car, a quad, a gator, um, a horse, a tractor, um, are never appropriate obstetrical tools, right? So if you, two people cannot pull it out the way that it's positioned, it's not coming out like that. So we need to reassess and make a new plan going forward. So oh, this is so showing another angle um, for a normal delivery. So again, showing pulling, rotating, and then arcing the calf down. Um, I also want to say um, that having a good stance, and that calf might have hit the ground a bit harder than we would recommend, um, but um, having a good stance and a good like wide stance is important because you're putting a lot of pressure here. And once again, that, that chest and the shoulder blades leave that pelvis and start to come out, all that resistance goes away and the calf typically comes relatively easily. Um, and you don't wanna be falling down. And if it's wet or slippery, or there's lots of lube on the ground or it's icy, um, you can lose your balance and fall. So just again, be safe. All right. Um, this is now showing how to use the calf jack. And there was a question, a pre-submitted question about which type of calf jack we recommend. And so it, it's, it is this type that um, walks the legs out. So as you can see, if you push forward, uh, one, it, it, pull, it puts traction on the right leg. And then as I pull it towards me, it puts traction on the left leg. So it does that, that, that walking motion just by using the calf check. And then also I'm using it as a fulcrum. And then I just uh, use the, the chains to, to adjust the tension. Uh, so I'm not actually pulling the calf out by the chains. I'm using it as a fulcrum and then just basically adjust that, that tension on the chains. And you want to do that together with the cow. So when she pushes, you, you make that fulcrum motion. Um, and then it's also, it's also good if you have a second person, like in our case, that you know, can make sure that the head is coming out or who can um, help in rotating that calf as it comes out. Um, and then again, they can also help with catching the calf so it doesn't hit the floor too hard. So here is a picture that shows a calf that is, um, it's in anterior presentation. So head first as it should be. Um, it's, it's a dorsal sacral position, but it has its left front leg retained at the carpus. Um, so we're showing you now how to correct such a, um, such a problem. So this is basically inside our calf, our, our cow dystocia dummy. Um, so this is, this would be your hand going in and, uh, finding that, that problem. And you always want to protect the uterus by cupping the feet, um, the little hoofs to make sure you're not doing damage to the uterus. And then let me just restart this again. 
So just see um, how we're correcting this. So you, you feel the leg, and then what you want to do is you want to come from the middle, basically. So it will give you more room if you try and pull that leg to the middle, uh, basically towards the belly, towards the underside of the calf, and then rotate it up. And so once that's corrected, then you can just proceed as before. And hopefully it will result in an easy delivery. So if you've um, gone in to examine the cow and find that she has a head flexed or a head retained to the left or the right, um, there are a couple of different ways to go about this. We talk about a front hand or a back hand approach, basically. And for me, it depends on what's easiest based on which side the cow or the calf's head is flexed to, whether I go in and use the front of my hand or go in and basically backhand it to pull it back around. And I tend to be stronger when I go in and backhand it like this sometimes to get the cow's or the calf's head back into a normal um, position. Uh, but it's really going to depend on your um your setup, your arm strength, and which way the calf's head is flexed to the left or to the right. But either way, you're going to go typically grabbing the muzzle of the calf. You're going to gently rock it to sort of loosen it and then pull it around into the center, again, right in between the front legs, hopefully. Just like you were protecting the uterus with your hand when you were moving the hooves, you want to do the same thing with the muzzle because the lower incisors, those lower teeth of the calf's um, lower jaw can also cut right through the uterus, cervix, and vagina. So you really don't want to be doing that as you're doing your manipulations. And again, as much lube as possible to help this out. So we have a device in addition to obstetrical um, chains called a head snare. And this is what it looks like. It's basically a, a wire with a lockable loop there that you can attach a chain to. The proper use of this, it's nice because it can help to stabilize the head. Many of you, if you've corrected neck flexions before, you know that when you get that head back to where you want it to be, it often just flops right back to where you started, right? So it can be a little bit challenging. The idea of this is to stabilize the head. So you go in, I typically put it on the back of my hand and then go. And again, it's usually going to be blind, but you're going to put it behind the ears and behind the pole of the calf's head. You're gonna bring that around and you're gonna put that adjustable Y piece right into the mouth of the calf. Very safe to use in the live calf, but you're gonna snug it up right into the corners of the mouth so that the head is only moving with the head snare. You're not gonna put a lot of tension on this. It's gonna be there to stabilize the head as you put tension on the legs when you're delivering because you really don't wanna be putting all of your tension um, on the uh, head. You might lead to some neck issues. So this can be quite helpful. If you don't have a head snare, um, you can use other things. You can use rope. Um, as much as I don't like to take baling twine up into the uterus just because it's dirty, you could do that in a pinch where you could make a loop and do the same thing to stabilize the head. Um, and this is gonna show you with the calf outside of the cow, what it looks like, whether to, to bring the head back into center along in alignment with the front limbs, front hand or back hand. It's gonna depend again what's easiest for you to achieve given the position of that. And then the head snare, as you can see, it's gonna go behind the pole, behind the ears. Again, since it's blind, you're gonna be feeling your way around, set it behind one ear, go over to the other ear, and then slide that adjustable Y piece right up into the mouth. Um, and again, I, I find this to be a very handy instrument when I have a head flexion that I'm trying to correct. But once you secure it all the way, you can very safely and easily move that head around at your own will um, without hurting the calf. Okay, so now we're talking about the feared breach. And so again, this is this is difficult. So this is this is hard to correct. Um, but you know, you should give it a go um, after what you learn here today. 
And again, you know, if you feel like you're not making progress, this is just not working. Uh, in, be honest with yourself and um, try and, and, and reach that veterinarian. So, but the way to do it, so again, you do, you want to um, repulse it back into the uterus as much as you can. So that is picture B. So you want to push that calf in. Um, and then going to picture C on the lower left, the way to get that hind limb up is um, you have to go in with, with both arms, essentially. And first, and we'll show you how to do that um, in a little bit uh, with, the, with our calf dummy, but you basically you, uh, you pull on the hawk and you, you pull it up as much as you can, and then you push it to the side. And that will bring the foot into the, the middle. And that is, again, the best way to bring that foot up and into the birth canal. Again, make sure that you cup the hoofs with your hand so that you're avoiding damage to the uterine wall. Um, but that's essentially what you need to do. And so let's see. So next we do have a movie on that. Um, so you, you bring, you pull on, the, on that hawk, you bring that up, you cup the foot and you push on the hawk to the outside and you bring the foot medially. I mean, you know, it's not gonna be that easy, obviously. Uh, but essentially that is the motion that you are attempting. And you, you have to bring both legs up. It's not gonna work with just one leg. I know you're probably thinking, well, that's a rubber calf. Nothing bends that way normally. Yes. Um, but you'll be surprised at how much flexibility you have um, and how bendy the hind limbs can be when you're correcting this. You don't wanna force it to the point where you're breaking a leg, obviously. Um, but by pushing that hock out and pulling that fetlock and hoof inward, you're basically creating that bubble of airspace that you can make that correction in. And while you retro pulse the calf and extend the leg at the same time, you can actually put that leg into a normal extended posture. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things going on here, isn't there? So first off, it's very dirty. And while while calving and giving birth in general, no matter what the species, is by no means a sterile event, um, we do wanna be clean about it. And especially if we're going into her reproductive tract to intervene, we don't wanna be taking the whole barnyard with her, right? So we do need to keep it as clean as possible. The head snare is not positioned correctly. So it's behind the ears and the pull of the calf's head. But as you can see, the Y piece is not lodged in the calf's mouth. So you really don't have control of the head. Um, there are chains on the, uh, uh, around the fetlock, so that's good, but there's only tension being applied on one chain, the one off to the right, and the other one on the other side is just dangling down and not doing anything. So we're not having a well-orchestrated traction that we're applying to this calf to deliver. So a lot of things that could be improved here. Okay, so what should you do immediately post-delivery? So as we have pointed out before, you know, don't be too complacent that, you know, you were able to deliver the calf, you do have to check for another calf. And then you also want to check for any tears or hemorrhage. Uh, so a tear in the uterus is unfortunately often not a good prognosis. I mean, there could also be vaginal tears. And um, if there, if you do feel like there is a uterine tear, um, you know, get in touch with your vet. As I said, it's, uh, it's often, it can lead to um, complications, um, vaginal tears as well. You may uh, end up having to treat the cow with antibiotics, um, a hemorrhage if there, some blood is normal. Um, so what we're, what, when you should get concerned is when there is a lot of frank blood just dropping out, dripping out or oozing out where you, you think that this seems more than usual. 
um, there could be a blood vessel damaged in the process and uh, that should be taken care of. So that needs, that needs to be stopped. Um, if depending on the size of the vessel that can lead to a dead cow. So, you know, just, just check for those things um, uh, to make sure that, you know, everything is, everything is, is normal. And then you want to turn your attention to the neonate. So we want to clean the nose, um, make sure that they can breathe, that they don't have part of the placenta still stuck to their face. Um, you, you want to, you can rub them vigorously, um, tickle them with straw that encourages breathing as well. If they are not breathing, uh, you can pour some cold water on their head on the pole, just to give them a, a, a startle, um, and that may entice them to start breathing. If they're already breathing fine, you don't need to do that. Um, you want to check the umbilicus, make sure that there's no hemorrhage. If they are bleeding from the umbilicus, you can just tie it off. Um, you do want to dip the umbilicus, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. There was a, a question pre-submitted. Uh, you can use um, an, a betadine or iodine solution. Uh, you can use um, chlorhexidine solution. Um, and um, you want to repeat that in, in if, if possible, um, you want to do it, you know, at least twice. Um, be clean about that. So using a disposable cup is recommended so that you don't end up with a cup that's dirty, full of bacteria, and you actually, uh, it's counterproductive what you're doing. You want to check the calf for any congenital abnormalities. So that could be a cleft pellet. Um, you want to make sure it has an anus. Um, you want to check for uh, hernia. So um, umbilical hernias are common. Just make sure that uh, the calf is in, in good condition. And then really important, you want to make sure that the calf gets colostrum, um, ideally within the first hour of life. So the best predictor for whether a calf will be able to get that colostrum on its own is a suckle reflex. So this is from a study where they looked for predictors for what gives an indication for whether a calf, and these are beef, beef calves, uh, whether they will start suckling on their own and um, consume enough colostrum within four hours after birth. And this a strong suckle reflex is really the best predictor for that. They looked at um, uh, indicators in the blood. Uh, they looked at um, other behaviors. Uh, so they, they, they looked at a lot of different parameters and really the suckle reflex is all you need to do. So if that calf suckles your finger strongly, it, they usually in good shape. If they do not, however, you do need to make sure that that calf gets colostrum. So how do you accomplish that? Um, so you want to start with putting the calf in sternal recumbency. In them. So you want to put your calf in sternal recumbency. So setting it up basically, and then, you know, encourage it a little bit to stand. Uh, lead it up to the teat, make it see whether it's it's doing it on its own. But if it's not, if it's just not getting it, um, then you need to make sure it will drink its colostrum. So you can try and bottle feed it um, with either after milking out the cow or with another colostrum product. Um, and if it's not suckling either, then you need to use an esophageal feeder. And we'll show you a little video of how to do that in a little bit. So what about colostrum replacer? So there are products out um, that can be used in case you do not have an alternative. So um, if you have a stillborn calf, you can milk out that cow and keep the uh, colostrum frozen for up to a year. 
So you can put that either into one of those feeding bottles. Um, but what's, what's actually recommended is to put it in a Ziploc bag. So double bag it in a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer so that when you saw it, you have a bigger surface area so that it thaws more quickly um, and you're less likely to damage the proteins that are in the colostrum by temperatures that are too high on the outside. So, um, so yeah, so try and, fr and have some frozen colostrum stored. Um, purchasing it from dairies, that can be um, problematic, especially because a lot of dairies are struggling with diseases like Yoni's disease and bovine leukosis virus. So we talked about that last time in the BQA session about biosecurity. So that could be a biosecurity breach. Um, so you want to make sure that, well, you trust that dairy or that they are testing for those diseases so you don't uh, inadvertently introduce them to the, to the herd. And then, as I said, there are these products. And what's really, really important is that they actually say replacer. So if they say supplement, then that's not the same. And that's not good enough. So colostrum supplements, they're usually only used to supplement, as the name says, colostrum. So you can mix that into other colostrum, for example, from a heifer that may not have um, enough IgG, so enough immunoglobulins but it's, it's not the same as the replacer. So I can't stress that enough. So if you do buy something, it has to say replacer. Okay, so hopefully everything has gone well with your um, calving assistance and the calf is doing well. Uh, there are some what we call periparturian problems that can arise. We just wanted to mention here um, so we'll talk about vaginal prolapses, uterine prolapses, and retained placentas. Um, we're not going to talk about down cows too much, um, often more of a, a dairy cow problem, but certainly cows can get weak and go down and not want to stand up because of a number of factors. Um, one being mineral imbalances, so hypocalcemia um, is probably the most common one that we see, or hypo, so like low calcium or low magnesium statuses. Um, but we can also see what we call um, um, nerve paralysis. And so there's a nerve called the obturator nerve that runs along the pelvis. And if you've had a really hard pull or the calf has been stuck in the pelvis for quite a while, it can actually numb that nerve and actually, actually interfere with that calf's ability, that cow's ability, excuse me, to stand up. And so there can be some physical reasons why she might not be standing after a really hard, um, hard labor. Okay, we'll go to the next one, I think. Um, so the vaginal prolapse um, almost always happens before calving. Okay, so this is a result of the um, a lot of pressure in the cow's abdomen, pushing on the cervix, pushing on the vagina. And as you can see, we you know we like to classify things. There are different grades of, of and severities of vaginal prolapses, but basically it's the walls of the vagina kind of ballooning out of the vulva where you can see it. And in very minor cases, you only see it when the cow lays down, she stands up and it goes right back in, not typically a problem, all the way up to where we can get the cervix starting to prolapse out, as you can see in grade three and four. Um, this becomes a problem because it can really compromise that tissue and dry out and even lead to infection of the vagina and the cervix there. So we do have a couple of different ways we can correct that before calving. And go to the next slide. The most common one would be to place a buner stitch, which um, you may have seen before, where we give her an epidural and then we basically make a very large um, suture with some umbilical tape around her uh, vulva to hold her vagina in place until she calves. Uh, of course, this needs to be removed before calving. Um, other, you don't want her to try and calve through it because you can get into some disastrous situations there. Um, but it does work to hold this in. We do know that there's a heritable component to vaginal prolapses. And so we typically recommend if a cow or a heifer has had a vaginal prolapse before that she not be rebred the following year. And again, almost always um, before calving and very characteristic by having that smooth tissue, smooth walled um, prolapse sticking out. That's in contrast to a uterine prolapse. So um, this is 
going to be after calving. And again, often associated with a long dystocia, a very hard pull, um, low calcium. Uh, it's also been attributed to copper and selenium imbalances, uh, uterine exhaustion, and older cows. So basically what happens is the, the uterus loses all of its tone um, and becomes very floppy and flimsy. And it starts to evert. So as you can see in the diagram, it basically turns inside out and prolapses out the vagina. Um, certainly a more urgent situation when this happens than a vaginal prolapse. And you can tell this because it's happening usually within 15 or 20 minutes after the calf is born. Um, and you can see all the caruncles, so all the placental attachments on the uterus, very different from that smooth vaginal prolapse we were just looking at. Um, happens in all of our livestock species. This is more urgent that we need to get her in, get her restrained and replace it. Um, and I think we have a, the next slide to talk about that. So we will almost either put her in the chute um, or if she's down, we can sort of frog leg her there. Um, we almost always need an epidural in place so that she's not pushing against us. We'll clean the uterus off as best as we can. We'll lift it up to get some of that fluid and congestion out of it. And then you know, the old adage of pouring a bag of sugar on the uterus works quite well. So we'll use sugar or glycerol or in some cases Epsom salts just to try and reduce fluid and swelling and shrink it down. And then we'll kind of knead it back in and replace it in the cow in its normal anatomical location. Um, and they generally, once it's replaced, do quite well. There isn't a heritable component. Um, if there are no other concerns, I wouldn't have a problem breeding this cow back again for the following season. The one thing that can happen, as you can imagine, if this is all out and the cow is running around and the uterus is swinging back and forth, it can be a problem because on the inside, there are a couple of ligaments that are holding that whole uterus in place. And there are a couple of very large blood vessels that run through those ligaments. So if she's running and it's swinging back and forth, it is possible for one of those large arteries that was supplying the pregnant uterus to rupture and for her to hemorrhage. Um, and that almost always results in death when that happens. And so it is a serious thing. So we wanna keep them calm. Um, and if we're walking in up to the chute, do it in a slow, calm manner. Um, another problem that can occur postpartum is the retained placenta. And we speak of a retained placenta if uh, that placenta isn't, hasn't been passed after 12 hours <coughs> post calving. And so there are a few risk factors. So usually abortions or stillbirths um, because part of that hormonal cascade also contributes to the passing of the placenta. And so in an abortion or a stillbirth, that cascade is um, probably not functioning as well as in a normal birth. Um, and so some of those cues for the placenta are missing. Also twins or dystocia, induction of parturition um, can lead to often to a retained placenta, metabolic disorders. So again, um, a low calcium or low selenium. And then ponderosa pine needle toxicity can also result in a retained placenta. So it's basically, you have to think of it like, like Velcro, right? So the caruncles are on the maternal side and the cotyledons are on the placental side and they fit together and they need to separate. Um, so there are these micro attachments and um, they need to detach themselves. And this is partly done through, through, um, through this hormonal cascade, but also the immune system. And hence, if there is um, a lack of, of selenium, if selenium is deficient, then that can lead to a deficient immune system and hence uh, to a retained placenta. So what should you do when you see it? Um, so first of all, what, what are the consequences when a cow does end up with a retained placenta? So the good news is that most of them um, will be just fine 
So 80% about will not get sick. Um, however, uh, the others, you may see some straining, vaginitis, fever, and then metritis, so an infection of the uterus. So what should you do? So the best thing is really to do nothing. Eventually, that placenta will fall off. Um, it, will, it will detach. It may take a few days. But I know there is there's probably a lot of temptation to wanting to pull it out, especially after a couple of days when it starts to look really nasty and you're like, I could just, I could just pull on that thing and it will probably come out. And that might be true, but the thing is that you may um, end up not, you know, leaving some of those micro attachments behind and that in turn can then lead to some infection. It can set the cow up for, for infection. So there used to be um, uterine lavages uh, used to be done and we don't really do that anymore because it turns out that, that you know, putting anything in the uterus postpartum is probably doing more damage. It's probably irritating more than doing anything else. Um, and plus, you, you really need the immune system to do its job in breaking those attachments. And so if you're interfering with antibiotics, you may actually interfere with that process, with that natural process. However, what you should be doing is monitoring those cows that, have, that do have a retained placenta. If they're nursing their calf, if they're eating fine, then really there's nothing for you to do. Um, however, if you feel like that cow isn't um, doing as well as she should, if uh, she's not producing enough milk or if she just seems a little bit off, take her temperature. If she does have a fever, then she probably does need to go on antibiotics, on systemic antibiotics, not the uterine lavage. All right. And now we're actually getting to the pre-submitted questions. So one of the questions was, would you show how to perform the medic and squeeze and then talk about the diameter and the length of the rope? Um, and so this came too late for us to actually show you in a, in a video, but I did pull out, I did pull up a video that is on YouTube that, that shows how to do this, but um, just about the rope. And you, know, you can see what kind of rope uh, he is using, but you know, half inch rope, if you know make sure it's it's soft or flexible and the length i you know make sure it's long enough to do this thing it's probably 12 feet will be enough but let's just watch this hello i'm dan Severson. i'm the newcastle county ag agent for the university of dollar and today i'm going to demonstrate the madigan squeeze technique the madigan squeeze technique was developed by who else dr john madigan it was used Almost suffering from neonatal maladjustment syndrome or dummy foals. However, today we're going to demonstrate this on dummy calves. However, please consult your vet. I am not a veterinarian to make sure you're making the proper diagnosis and get proper training. All you can do you're going to need for this technique is a long, soft rope with a loop at the end and then maybe some assistance. So, the first thing you do is you're going to find the loop with the end and you're going to pass it in between the front legs, up over the withers, and pass. The end of the rope through. So then you got your first loop around the camp. Then what you're going to do is you're going to make a, a second half hitch loop around the chest of the animal. Pull it around, firm it up, make it a little tight and snug. You're going to do the same thing with a second, another half hitch, pull your rope through, keeping it snug and tight. And then from the back, apply a small pressure, 10 pounds, and hold it for 20 minutes. This mimics the pressure put on the stage two labor of the birthing process. Once your 20 minutes is up, slowly release the pressure, undo your knots, let the calf weight back up. And now, She's back, back resetting. She's reset, ready to go. Yeah, so as, as he pointed out, this is for um, to 
to re-energize, so to speak, the dummy calf. So we're talking about newborn calves. So this is in the first 24 hours of life. Um, if the calf is just not, you know, if it's if it just doesn't have vigor. Um, so, you know, this could be the calf that is not suckling. Um, this technique, it was, as the, as the, they pointed out, developed by Dr. John Madigan, who is or was here at UC Davis before he retired for many, many years. And he developed this technique for foals, but it does work for calves as well. Um, uh, when you apply it, um, just make sure that, you know, don't put too much tension on this. Make sure that the calf can still breathe, obviously. But it is something, you know, it doesn't cost anything. It, it's, it's done fairly quickly. So um, you might as well give it a, a try. So this video, uh, we can, we can uh, give you a link to the video, um, but this is easily found on the internet by putting the squeeze on dummy calves. I'm sorry. So another question was, how do I prevent navel infections? Dipping navel in 7% iodine does not seem to help. So one of the things um, that you need to consider when using a navel dip is that um, that the navel dip is great, but it's not everything, right? So um, colostrum management and hygiene are probably more important uh, to avoid navel infections than the navel dip. Um, there's also some evidence that 7% iodine might actually be too strong, that it may actually cause too much inflammation and necrosis. I mean, it will definitely dry up that umbilicus. But if there's already been bacteria in that had entered at that point, then you're sealing them in. So um, even though it, you know, it can be a very good navel dip, I'm not saying, you know, don't use it. Um, but if you're already having problems, then, you know, you, you want to think about um, the whole, the whole process is the calving environment as clean and as dry as it can be. Um, how often, you know, can you apply that navel dip? Um, are you using, you know, single use cups to, to avoid any contamination? Um, and then, you know, if you are saying, okay, I'm, I've tried this, this is, you know, I'm doing everything I can, uh, maybe switch to something else. So try a chlorhexidine uh, dip. Um, there's also been a study that showed no difference between iodine dip and, and nothing. I'm not saying you, sh you shouldn't dip. I would definitely use a dip. Um, it, it can be very helpful, but it's not a guarantee and it's not, you know, you don't want to be too reliant on it. And Dr. McNabb, chime in anytime if you yeah, want to add anything. I agree. I'm a fan of a, of a betadine based dip. So it's a lot um, gentler, I guess, on the tissue, but it's still disinfecting. It's thick and viscous, so it sticks on to the umbilical cord. Um, dries up usually within about 12 hours, but really, like, um, like Gabby said, I mean, a clean environment is going to be the key to minimizing umbilical infections, minimizing infectious diarrhea, and minimizing all sorts of things. And so um, there's really no replacement for um, a clean calving area if you can provide it. So what are methods to reduce calving issues? And I mean, that's a, obviously a very big question. So these are just some of the ideas that came to mind. <laughs> so um, you probably, if you have problems with calves, with it, it's that it, it depends on what what is causing the calving issues, right? So, and we we went through all the different scenarios from the fetus to the to the cow or to the uh, the heifer, and um, if the problem is that the calves are too big, then um, you probably want to pick a bull with a better calving ease EPD. So expected progeny difference. Um, 
you can select them where um, they are likely to have calves that are a little bit smaller when they're born so that um, uh, it's easier it's easier for them to be delivered um, but the cows also need a good to be in good body condition right to avoid that exhaustion so if they are too skinny if they have a body condition score of four uh, for cows or for, for heifers, you want to have them at, at a six, actually, then it, they probably will run out of oomph um, during delivery. Uh, so that could be another issue. Um, if there are a lot of problems with heifers in particular, then um, tr uh, scoring the reproductive tract could be helping. So you select your replacement heifers based on the size of their pelvis. And so a veterinarian can do that. They can measure the size of the pelvis. Um, they can also score the reproductive tract, the uterus and um, the ovaries at that point, so that you are selecting heifers that are, uh, have a, a wider pelvic area as well as are already um, in puberty and so are more likely to become pregnant. And then um, another um, problem could be that you are not there to uh, determine that there is a problem frequently enough. So if it goes on too long, then it's always harder to uh, correct a problem. So frequent observations um, could be helping as well. Um, there are, There is a trick um, to helping that calves are born during the daytime. And that is if you feed um, your cows or heifers in the evening, so between nine and 11, so, or, so later in the evening. Um, and you have to do that for about two weeks, two or three weeks before the calving season starts. So it needs a little bit of lead time. And for some reason, it, it just leads to the, um, to the calves more likely, you know, it's not a guarantee, of course, but more of the calves are born during the daytime if you do that. Um, another question was, which beef cattle breed is best suited for easy calving on range in Northern California? So that's also a little bit tricky because um, essentially if you, you know, if you have good management, then any breed could be okay. Um, and if you have bad management, then also any breed could be a problem. <laughs> so as maybe a little bit of a rule of thumb, um, anything that has Brahmin influence tends to have lower calving difficulties. So for example, a Brangus or a beef master. But again, you know, there are a lot of factors that play a role. Um, as a, this is kind of a, that's it's a little bit of out of left field, but um, there is um, a, um, a concept where um, Wagyu bulls are being leased out to breed heifers, and then they typically buy back those Wagyu crosses um, for, uh, for, for Wagyu beef, um, and Wagyu tend to have also smaller calves. Um, so that leads to less problems with um, uh, heifer calving. And then, you know, you would get your replacements from your from your cow herd um, and just sell all those heifers, uh, sell all those heifer calves back to the Wagyu breeder. I mean, that's, you know, it's a little bit of a niche, but it's, it's another suggestion. And I don't know, Brett, Brett, if you have anything else to that topic, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I go back to the genetic selection and um, selecting bulls or selecting semen if you're using AI um, to have low birth weight EPDs or calving ease bulls um, if you're known to have problems. And I, I think there's so much to be said um, for all the tools we have now for bull selection, um, they can really help out in certain situations. All right, so another question was how to tube calves and what supplements um, for orphan calves can be used. 
So again, um, there is plenty of stuff on the on YouTube, and I have one here that's that's pretty nice that shows well Very how to use an esophageal feeder or stomach tube is vital feeder. to supporting calves in their most vulnerable state. Whether you're providing colostrum to a newborn or treating a calf for dehydration, proper esophageal feeding technique can save lives on your operation and improve the overall health of your herd. To get started, it's important to have your supplies clean and ready to use. To begin, we first need to choose what type of feeder to use. There are two standard types of feeders. The most commonly used esophageal feeder is the McGrath feeder. This feeder is a sealed unit that is most practical when handling calves by yourself. The second type of feeder commonly found is a bag feeder. This setup allows for fluids to be poured into the top of the bag and hung from a height to allow the fluids to flow slowly via gravity. In order to prevent aspiration or fluid in the lungs, we need to ensure the calf is in the proper position. In a perfect world, we would always have the calf standing while delivering fluids. However, if the calf is sick and too weak to stand, we can tube them in a sitting position or even lying down. Regardless of how the calf is positioned, it must be properly restrained. If standing, back the calf into a corner for better head control. Never tip the calf's nose upward while tubing. This will change the angle of the entrance into the trachea and make you more prone to pointing the tip of the tube feeder down and entering the trachea. Leave the calf's head in a neutral position that is above the level of its stomach. The calf's mouth can be opened by gently squeezing the corners of the mouth or by grabbing its head over the bridge of the nose and putting slight pressure on the upper palate or gums. Once the mouth is opened, the empty tube should be passed slowly along the tongue to the back of the mouth. Once the tube reaches the back of the tongue, the calf will start chewing and swallowing. At this point, the tube is passed down into the esophagus. If the tube is not advancing easily, then slowly pull it out and try again. Never force the tube down. The esophagus is slightly to the left of the trachea, and once placed, the tube should be easily palpated next to the trachea. If it's properly positioned, the rings of the trachea or windpipe and the rigid enlarged esophagus can both easily be felt. If you can't feel both of these, remove the tube and start again. Remember the 2 2 rule. You should be able to feel the trachea and the stomach tube. Once proper placement is confirmed, the tube can be unclipped and the container can be tipped up to allow liquid to flow down into the stomach. Ensure the liquid is at body temperature or 38 degrees Celsius to prevent shock to an already weak calf. Allow the feeder to empty slowly. This could take upwards of three minutes. The calf will regurgitate less with a slower flow rate. When feeding is finished, clip or kink the tube to ensure no leftover fluids can drain out as the tube is slowly pulled out. This prevents aspiration into the lungs. The tube should be cleaned and sanitized and then allowed to drain and dry. It's crucial to have two esophageal feeding tubes, one for tubing sick or scouring calves and one for giving colostrum to avoid disease and pathogen transfer between calves. Dealing with cattle during this unusual cold, oh, we already have passed the time, so let's um, do this quickly. So cattle are actually uh, pretty good at dealing with cold weather. They have thermoneutral zones, so that's the, 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 the temperature where they don't have to expend any energy for either cooling or for um, creating more, more warmth, is between 45 and 55 degrees. So pretty low um, and 55 to 68 for small calves. So they're, they're actually okay with colder weather. Um, what might stress them, however, is storm. So a lot of rain, a lot of wind. So being exposed uh, to those storms can be hard on them. Um, they probably need a little bit more energy during those times. Uh, and just trying to have them on a pasture maybe that's less exposed. Uh, if you know, well, we have another atmospheric river coming. Um, that might be helpful. Make sure they still have fresh, clean water. If you are in an area where it's actually freezing, then obviously you want to check your water troughs to make sure that they're not frozen. And if there's a lot of standing water or it's, it's really muddy, 
Um, that's a good environment for foot rot or an also leptospirosis. So make sure you, you, know, you keep an eye on those feet, check for lameness, and also make sure that your lepto vaccinations are kept up to date. Um, it's usually recommended to give those twice a year. And then uh, there was a question about alpha CDNT, whether that's a good program to give to calves at birth. So um, I'm assuming this is alpha seven. So that's a seven way clostridial vaccine. Um, this is an oil based vaccine. So it does tend to stick around longer. And that may be actually good to avoid some of the maternal antibody interference that we usually have with young calves. And for young calves, it's, I'm not a big fan of giving vaccines to young calves because of the maternal antibody interference and also because their immune system is really underdeveloped early on. Um, but this may be an exception. So this is actually one where they tend to respond um, pretty well. Um, they do need a booster at, band, at branding or, or later. So one dose is not enough. Um, and now, whether this is a good idea to give it to them at birth, it really depends on whether you have problems with black leg or um, clostri other clostridial diseases. Um, if you don't have problems um, in these young calves with those diseases, then it might just be a better idea to keep up the vaccination in the cow herd um, so that they will get those antibodies through the colostrum. And um, it's also, I mean, those, those vaccines tend to give big lumps. So it's also easier on the calves in that sense. And that was the end of the pre-submitted questions. Thank you to Dr. McNabb and Dr. Meyer for sharing with us tips and tricks to assist cows during calving and helpful practices for post-calving care. During the video, there were references to other webinars. You can find recordings of those sessions on this YouTube channel. Thank you for watching this webinar recording that was brought to you by the University of California Cooperative Extension and University of California Davis Veterinary Medicine and was co-hosted by University of California Cooperative Extension Advisors, Tracy Shore, Grace Woodmancy, Rebecca Ozeran, and Specialist, Dr. Gabby Meyer.